I remember a friend of mine some years ago, very long time ago, had gotten married, and people did not see this woman as attractive. They judged her, and they gave her a hard time. And they didn't feel that she had traditionally feminine features. They just didn't feel that she was worthy of marriage. They didn't feel that she was worthy of the husband that she ended up marrying. And because she was my friend, I saw things differently. But she was aware of people's perceptions. And I remember us having a conversation after she had gotten married, and she said, for me, the bottom line is this. If a man does not absolutely adore me, I can't be with him. And I gasped. Because we live in a society where we're not supposed to say those things, right? If someone likes us or they think that we're awesome, um, where it's supposed to be something that just happened by chance. We wait on other people's approval and validation of us um, because it's being humble, it's being modest. It's an American value of, oh, shut, this old thing, right? Is how we say, oh, you look nice, this old thing. And so this friend of mine had taught me a very important and valuable lesson. And it was that in order for her to get the things that she wanted out of life, she had to be comfortable with owning it. She had watched her mom go through a relationship where she had been abused. And her husband had been with multiple women and had multiple children outside of her. And she had made up her mind that that was not going to be her reality. So the standard for her was, if he does not adore me, this is not going to work. I can't be with him. And as time went on, I met my own partner. I told him, if you do not adore me, I cannot be with you. And it took me years to be able to say that. It took me years to be able to say out loud that I'm with someone that was worthy of being adored. I did not have the type of features that were considered traditionally beautiful. Um, I come from a family where all the women, majority of the women are petite and they're smaller. I was someone who was always smart. And you all know how the smart girl gets treated, right? Um, I wore glasses and people, and I still wear glasses. And so my kids are always breaking my glasses is why I don't have them on. Um, and so according to other people's definitions, I didn't fit the model of beauty or of worthiness. And so when this woman had said this, it was like she was echoing into a really dark and deep tunnel and well, way at the bottom. I was way at the bottom and she was screaming the standard from afar and from atop. And I had to learn how to build myself up until I got to that standard. And what I learned is that often much as I don't want to say this, truth is often not truth. Perception is truth. The things that how we, I could tell a person all day long that one plus one equals two. But if in their mind that's not what it is, that's not what it is for them. And so to some folks, this woman wasn't traditionally beautiful. I'm not traditionally beautiful. To this, for some folks, this was someone who did not deserve to be married to the man that she was married to. And yet, she married him without flinching because to her and her truth, this is the very thing that she deserved. And so I started really paying attention to perception and how I was perceiving myself. I look at a lot of science fiction, and, and in science fiction, there's multiple universities, I mean, universes and realities, right? And, and they're happening at the same time. And so in one person's reality or universe, in one person's universe, reality looks one way. In another person's universe, reality looks another way. Now, I'm not trying to get all deep and et cetera, et cetera. I'm just talking, I'm reestablishing a basic baseline for how we're dealing with this session today. 
And so in my universe, I understood that how I perceived and understood myself was going to shape and influence my life. And so I learned to take control and, and to be intentional about what I perceived and what I understood for myself. I didn't believe in leaving things up to chance. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that I only have so much things, so many things that I can control. I understand that when I come in this room, I can't alter the space and change the lights and the rug and all of these things. So I'm very aware about my limitations. And in fact, I love limitations because it's a challenge to me. How can I make the things that I want to happen happen with these things that are given to me? How can I defy and do the unimaginable within, within, within the constraints that I've been given? So I'm OK with those things. The point that I want to stress to you, though, is I realized that if I was going to have an outcome that in order for me to get the outcomes that I wanted, I had to first perceive it. I had to think about it. I had to understand it. And then from there, I had to learn how to say it. And then from saying it, I had to learn how to walk it and, and build, develop the behaviors to go along with it. So today is about thoughts, it's about speaking, it's about behavior. Now, I'm not Ayala Van Zandt or Dr. Phil. I don't have any hocus pocus for you. Um, I'm not going to call you beloved and do all of these things. Um, so I will keep it very down to earth, um, no new agey type stuff with me. I'm just telling you about ba basic things that I've learned to survive as a single mom of six, as a woman who's coming from poverty, who's also now a business owner, and who's a PhD candidate. The things that I'm telling you, I think, I think in life, certain principles are just universal. So I'm going to tell you something that you've probably already heard before, but what's going to make it even more believable is that it's coming from someone who was never supposed to have done any of these things, right? So the first thing is perception. When I was learning how to drive, um, First thing is a vision, I'm sorry. When I was learning how to drive, I learned this strange thing that I would never forget. If you're driving straight and you want to turn, you have to start turning your head in the direction that you want to turn. In my mind, you drive straight, and then when you get to the corner, then you turn. Then you, you look in the direction that you want to turn. But my driving instructor taught me that before you start turning, you have to start looking in that direction. It's a small, subtle thing that many of you probably just do naturally. But I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine walking, and I need to turn right here, and then getting right here, and then for the first time looking this way. What's wrong with that? I still turn. I still look. You don't see what's coming ahead. What else is going on? Can't prepare yourself for this, and that is important. Both of those things are important. It's a small yeah. difference. The difference between me look turning right here versus me, I'm sorry, looking right there versus me looking right here versus me looking right here. I'm still going forward, but my mind is preparing to go this way, and I'm looking in both directions. Give me one more reason why you start looking in that direction first. You made a choice. You made a choice. It's about choice. It's about being in control and, and choosing. It's about being deliberate. It's about leading yourself in that direction. It's a small thing. So make sure you say it again. So it's safety for other folks, too, right? That's good. Preparing for what your life is going to be. It's a small thing, but it's very, very important for safety reasons, for preparation reasons. You're able to size up the whole environment before you get there so you can make some decisions. 
in that split second. It's the idea that I always use relationships because it's the thing that people can relate to. It's no different from that woman who was saying, if I'm going to get married to someone, he's going to have to adore me. She'd already made up her mind. She'd already had the vision in place. She didn't just sit there, was in a window like we do in the cartoons and the, the movies, reading a book, and then all of a sudden somebody tripped over her, was just, and then the, the, the stars, I mean the, the heart and the stars happened in his eyes. Like that's not how that went. She established a standard from day one for her own life. When we, I look at this journey of life in a way that's very similar to driving. When you're driving, it's always good to start. How many folks just get in the car? You have to be, for me, I have to be very mad to do this or just have to get away. But how many folks just get in the car and don't know where they're going? Just wake up every day. Every day you get, every day, not every day, but how many people on a day-to-day -day basis get in the car or get on the bus and just have no idea where they're going on a regular basis? None of y'all? Your mom did? The reason why I say that is because, okay, so now, so in driving, usually we know where we're going. Usually, we plot out the course. Some of us wing it. We just show up. We know where we want to go. That's me. I know where I want to go. I figure out how I'm going to get there as I'm getting ready to get there, right? Um, and so I figure out the steps along the way. But at least I have that vision. But then it's also like driving because, you know, in real life, in movies, there's all of these scripts. In real life, when you go out into the world, the person next to you don't have the script that you have in your head, right? They're not like, and we're all going to just turn this way, and then, you know what? I know you want to get over. I'm going to wave at you and say, good morning, and I'm going to let you get over. That is not how driving works, yeah. right? It does not happen like that. Exactly, right? It's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of opening. It's a lot of passing. But it's a lot of unpredictability. I can't determine who's going to be on the street that day, who's going to make decisions. I can't. I didn't foresee the accident that's along the way. I didn't foresee all of these things. And so I am responding in real time. Life is like that. You have a vision. You have somewhere you want to go. But then along the way, everybody else have their own visions and their own directions and the, only things, the things that they're going through. The thing that has kept me safe and allowed me to survive is that no matter what has happened and what has been going on in this world, I've always been clear about what it is that I want to accomplish. And I've always been clear, for the most part, about how I want to feel as I'm going through this this journey. I know at times I bring the storm and I know at times I bring the calm. But those are two things and the reason why I say that and we're gonna get into something in a second is because when we're going on this journey to do the work and to, be, and to become who we want to become and to do the work that we want to do there are so many things that we can't control. But what you can control is your vision, what you see in your head, or what you imagine for yourself. So even if it's not your physical vision, the thing that you imagine in your head for yourself, and you can control who you want to be along this journey. And people will test you. Well, my partner, every day, without fail, if he's having a bad, he's the type of person, he'll wake, if he's having a bad day, he would sit up at the edge of the bed at about 3 o'clock in the morning. He's going to say, babe, you woke? No, I'm not woke. You know I ain't woke. <laughs> no, because you know this and this and this happened today, and I can't believe it. He wants to go through this whole long whatever. And I have to nicely tell him, I need eight hours of sleep, so this is what I'm going to do. I will give you 15 minutes of vent, 
and I'm gonna and then I'm gonna go back to sleep. What he wants me to do is get angry like him. He wants me to wake up and we have a no, ain't none of that happened. I'm gonna give you 15 minutes and I'm going back to sleep. And then tomorrow when I wake up, I'm gonna still be as calm as I was. I can't control his behavior, but I can control how I react to him. And this is important. The reason why I, I want to get that off, because when we start talking about vision, I want you to be able to, as you develop your plan and your vision, I want you to keep who you want to be in mind as you go along. So all right, let's start. When we talk about perception, we talk about the magic of it. I told you I'd gotten this from uh, my favorite series, my favorite series, which is coming to the end, The Originals. And how many of you all watch The Originals and Vampire Diaries? <laughs> all right, yes, yes. So in one episode, um, someone had told, another, a character told another character, your magic is flawed because your perception is flawed. The way that you understand yourself, the way that you're, um, the way that you perceive things, the way that you are making sense of things is flawed. And so the outcomes, your magic, not my magic, what you do doesn't impact what I do. Your, your perception of yourself ultimately at the, at, at the bottom line of the grander scheme of things does not impact how I perceive and how I function and what my magic is going to be. But how you perceive yourself does impact your own magic. And I believe that everybody is magical in their own way. Everybody can make something out of nothing. I don't know if any of you all ever been in the house and you were at your last in terms of food. And you got flour, water, and maybe one other ingredient. And all of a sudden, you do something that you never thought you would do. Right? You have invented something for the first time. That resourcefulness, I believe all of us can conjure something out of the very little bit that many of us have been given. Right? Whether it's a little bit in terms of ability, whether it's a little bit in terms of finances, whether it's a little bit in terms of whatever, we could all make something extraordinary out of it. So in that sense, you are magical. So now here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think, I want to share this. When I was younger, my biggest goal in life was to be a construction worker, not because I wanted to build anything. I did not want to build anything at all. I wanted to wear a hard hat, and I wanted to wear a belt, and I wanted to whistle at men from the scaffold. <laughs> that was my dream. I wanted a boyfriend who drank beer and played video games. I wanted, something very, I wanted a very simple life. That was the extent of my vision. So when other people are like, yeah, I want to be a construction worker, I'm like, yeah, I really did not want to be a construction worker. What I really wanted was the appearance of being a construction worker, and I wanted to stand on the scaffold for eight hours. I wanted to whistle at men. I don't even know how to whistle, but I had seen uh, people do that. And then as time went on, I had read this book called Purpose Driven Life, and it said that you are not an accident. Your parents may not have wanted you, um, but you were supposed to be here. And I'm like, whoa was not supposed to be here to stand on the scaffold and whistle with men, right? Like there was something much bigger for my life and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I was very surprised that when I discovered, I was very surprised to discover that the reason why that I was gonna find my purpose in all the things that had been my pain. So being able to spin all my pain into something powerful. So with that said, I want you all right now you look like you have something to say. What you got to say? You want you to tell me later? Okay. All right. I want you all right now, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to think of what is your vision for your life? What is your vision, what is your vision for your life? We'll, we'll start with that. Some of y'all are like, vision for my life. <laughs> I don't mean, I don't mean your mission. Your mission is the thing that you get up every day when your feet hit the ground, you know that I'm going to accomplish right. this today. Exactly. Right? That's, that's not what I mean. I mean, what is the big thing in the world 
that you want to change? How is the world going to end up being a better place? Because you live today. What is your vision? And that's a hard question. So many of us have been felt to believe that we're small and like we don't matter. So when it's, so the thought that we exist because we are valuable, that we have the possibility to change the world, is overwhelming for us and it's, it's unimaginable. And for some of the folks that I work with, it takes us up to six weeks for them to even be able to say, I think I'm starting to see a trace of that vision. So I want to challenge you right now to start thinking about in what ways do you matter and in what ways do you see yourself changing the world. I want you to write it down. I want you to think. I want to give you 10 minutes to think because this is not an easy question. And it don't have to be perfect. Because you exist, what attitudes should, would be changed in the world? What new technology can be created? Because you walk the earth today, what new conversations can be had? What books can be written because you exist? What is your vision? I don't care if you're somebody that's struggling with alcohol abuse or drug abuse. I don't care if you can't make, like, if you're like me and you can't make the words sit down in your head. What can you do? How do you imagine the world being different because you live today? I hear folks sighing over here. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'd love to be able to do. But mm -mm, I want to hear it. <laughs> Write it down. I think we need to move on, Chad. I guess okay. we need yes to the first meeting, and I'm glad I got this one. I need to say it honestly that I need to hear. Thank you. <laughs> things that you want to do. I want this to be the wildest dreams. Like I want this. I want you to be scared when you write. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I just wrote that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for all your inspiration. Thank you. She just needs to rest. Okay, I understand. Thank you for being here. I want whatever you write down. I want it to make you laugh. I want it to make you feel shy and uncomfortable. I want you to blush at whatever it is that you're writing about yourself. I want you to feel like a kid again. I want you to feel overwhelmed, a little nervous. I want your ideas to be crazy. If you don't have 10 people in your head telling you right now that you can't do whatever you're writing, you ain't writing the right thing.
I want you to be, some of you all in this room, I want you to think about the ways in which you're dealing with limitations, whether it's physical ability, whether it's things that's happening inside of your head, whether it's age. I want your vision to defy all of those things. I want your vision to go against any barrier that you think you may have. Because right now, your job is not to make it happen. Your job is to imagine it. You don't even have to believe it. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe it, that's even better. For this part of the exercise right now, I just need you to imagine it. minutes. All right, looks like most of you all are almost done or are done. One more minute. All right, how does that feel? So before we even talk about what you did, how does that feel? Because that's important, the feeling. Yeah, and then what? When I wrote the, the book, um, so many of the women had never been asked to tell their stories. One of the women, um, her story always moves me. Um, and I actually want to share a little bit because of just what you said, how relevant that is. Whenever I think about this woman, I'm always moved because Her story is probably the only story where you feel the raw emotion of what it means to be asked this question. She said, I think that I didn't know how to. Wow, so much shame, so much shame. I feel ashamed about myself. Like now, I'm feeling very my, my, my. It's like I'm not having confidence in where I'm going with this. I feel like I really don't have a story to tell. It's like, okay, what are you doing that nobody else is doing? You had children, okay? Your marriage didn't last. You had a, I'm not strong in those areas. And what you see, what I love about that, that paragraph is the hesitation, the my, 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 the what are you doing? The like, I don't have a story to tell. And what you all don't get to experience and even though it's coming through in that repetition of her language, it's her saying, I'm uncomfortable telling my story because no one has ever asked me. I've just lived my life. I've gone through the motions. And so now I'm telling my story. I'm censoring myself. This is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because I've never had an opportunity to sit down and reflect on all that I am and all that I've gone through. And now you're asking me, I'm embarrassed, and I'm uncomfortable, and I'm blushing because yeah, there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of pain, but 
there are some really extraordinary things about myself that I had never stopped to imagine. And now I'm experiencing it with you for the very first time in this question that you're asking me. And so for many of you all, this question about what is your vision, I'm hoping that it brings back memories about who you were as little people. Things that you believed in and that you valued and that you wanted before the world stopped, started telling you that you couldn't. I'm hoping that what that question does for you is to remind you that you were once a creative person and that you had dreams and that there was stuff that you felt you could do, that you were idealistic and you were crazy in terms of your ideas, the things that you imagined nobody else had imagined. And the reason why those things and those problems are not solved is because the person that was supposed to solve them and address them in the world, somebody had talked them out of it and that person was probably you. Right? So let's talk about some of the things that you imagined, that you saw in this vision. Tell me about your feelings first, and then tell me your vision. Anybody can volunteer. I'm not going to call on you. Yes. That right there is giving me chills, right? Yeah. Because you got to think about all the things that, the time period that that thing holds. You got to think about the history that's inside of it, the struggles, the triumphs, all the things that happen. What, yes? Um, I, all my experience now with this book is that John, my girlfriend Connie, my brother Travis, that's who I talk, my uncle John, my mom and dad, my real mom, that's up in heaven. Yeah. How I spoke to them, how I had my brother and my mom, that's how I spoke to them. My mom. So you see them, so they're part of your vision. Okay. Thank you. So your vision is that one day people will stop shooting folks? Okay. I didn't Thank you. Uh, see the world and they, they change things in life. Like what? This, what do you mean by see the world? Let's start with that one. Like going different places and seeing different places. Yes. And what do you mean by change things in life? Who else? Yes.
You, I have so many things I want to say behind that. So many things I, you have <coughs> taken us to step two and three. So I want to acknowledge your vision first, and then we're going to come back to a couple of things that you just said. Um, because I, what you're saying is very much so connected to the next things that I want you all to do. Okay, so thank you for that. We have you, we have you. I'm just saying at the beginning of the exercise, I was sort of ready to ask you this very practical, pragmatic, what I know I can do, and within my limitations of finances and circumstances, then when you started giving some more instructions, like think about what you like as a child, or you crazy, then I came up with the things that actually made me smile mm -hmm. and be happy. Like going to this conference, my biggest actual personal thrill was the water park. Yes. I was disappointed that my group last night was like, what are you guys doing sitting in a restaurant for hours eating and drinking when there's a water park? Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, that's right. And that's where I would have been for three days at night yes. if I could. Yes. But I'm with a group that isn't really into it. Yes. Maybe one person will maybe go, but they'd rather eat or drink or stop. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Take that shuttle. Yes. <laughs> yes. What were you about to say? Um, well, yeah, like she said, like, like sort of thinking, like, I'd love to go back to school because I never did because I had kids young and, you know, financially, I don't know all that. Okay. And as a kid, I always wanted to cure addiction. And yeah. I know that I couldn't cure it, but I would love to work with people with addiction because mm -hmm. now not only does it affect me growing up, now it's affecting me. Yeah. So, I need one more person, and we're going to bring together the things that you all have talked about. Oh, sure. You just kind of embarrass my father. Okay. And here, yeah. <laughs> That. I have six kids, and trust me, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Somebody else has their hands back. So, okay, so now I have more I want to add. Okay. <coughs> yes. One other person back there. Oh, we have <laughs> several folks. Okay. Bree, and then a the person behind Bree. is powerful.
So you want to change perceptions. Okay. All right. I'm going to come back to that one because it's, it's connected to what we're doing. Yes. She thought about when she was a kid. She always wanted to help others. So she was told that she couldn't, a lady told her that she couldn't help everybody, that she, she always liked education. She was raised in a single parent home. Um, and so this lady was pretty much putting limitations on you. So what she said is, in spite of people's perceptions of her, she's managed to accomplish some things. She's managed to get a bachelor's degree, and she still helps people. She's three credits away from her, back, from her master's degree, and she wants to write a book. And that she's a little choked up right now um, because why are you so choked up? You'll hear that voice. That's right. So you want to be able to change the way people experience other folks, people's perception. So one of the things that I can say, and I'm hoping this alleviates some folks in here, some of the anxieties. One of the things that I love is I love introducing myself in one of two ways. Depending on how I'm feeling, I flip it. 
Sometimes I say, hi, my name is Sagacious Levinson. I'm a PhD candidate and an entrepreneur. I'm also a single mom of six kids by 40 from dance from the south side of Chicago. I like the disruption that it creates. Sometimes I say, hi, my name is Sagacious Levinson. I'm a single mom of six kids by four different dads from, south, from the south side of Chicago. I'm also a PhD candidate and an entrepreneur. I like being able to interrupt the idea of what people think that I can be. And I like what it does for the person because it gives the person a gift. Because what they say, you know, people, you know, people by nature, we automatically go to us, right? Well, she can do it, I can do it, right? They're, they're like, oh, Sketches, you're great, but wait a minute, you got more kids than me, then maybe I can do, <laughs> right? Right, so they, they, people are thinking about me for two seconds, and immediately they're going right to them, like, oh, I think about all the things I could be accomplishing right now. Um, and so there is that gift of that learning and exchange, and so um, I think the more we're all breathing right now, we are all breathing the exact same oxygen for the most part. And if we, the more we're together in the same space, the more we're picking up on each other's cultures and values. And so, like that one video over the years changed so many things because I've never really had the honor of being in a room or at a conference with people who are very openly discussing what it means to live with disabilities. I have gotten so much more education than I can ever give you all, right? You all meaning the people that I'm supposed to be educating. You all are, are training and teaching me some things. So I want to bring together some of the things that you all said. You all want to shift perception. Um, you want to make people remember the experience they had of holding something that was 65 million years old. You want to remember and see on um, people that have passed away and who were once in your life and who are no longer here. You want to go back to school and get an education. You want to um, spend three days in Wisconsin on a shuttle bus going to the theme parks So now, we have said it. We have owned it. It's out. The thing about being able to say it is once you say it, you can't take it back. You can't, like once it's out there, it's out there. Right? You have broken a barrier within yourself just by saying it. And once that seal is broken, it's a done deal. Right? Because now you have shifted the whole entire universe. Something in this world is listening to you and now things are starting to operate because you have put it out there. You are conjure people. You are able to make things happen, make something out of nothing. You have that power. So now, let's talk about, that's your magic. The fact that you've said it, you just put, you just put it out there. You just created a spell just by saying it. Now, here is the trick and the problem. There were other things that was operating on you while you were saying it. There were other things that was like, no, you know you can't be doing this. You know you ain't going to be Mom got too many kids. You're from Mississippi. You ain't going to be able to do this. What do you do? The one thing, the one way, I, I fought a lot as a kid. I fought every day. And I learned to get good at it. And I've learned, I, and then once I fought, physically I learned how to fight in my mind. And any thought that was bullying me, I stopped what I was doing and had a full-blown conversation with it. And you know what I noticed? <laughs> it stopped bullying me. Well, what you mean I can't do such and such? Why? And then it would answer back. Well, you can't do it because such and such. After, after a while, you ask so many whys, that voice just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It can't keep up no more. So what was going on before was I kept trying to, if I just ignored it, it go away. And I just keep going about my day. And I will be in my own little world driving, and there's full-blown arguments in my head about, I, I want to accomplish this thing, and my auntie from such and such, and my cousin from this. And all of these people are having a full-blown conversation. They have a committee meeting. They've had a conference, a seminar, all of this in my head, breakout sessions, all type of stuff was happening in my head about what I could do or what I couldn't do. 
And I had no say so. I was just in the corner somewhere. Like, I, well, if, if, can I say something? In my own head. <laughs> in my own head. <laughs> and so at some point, I started talking back. And my kids will tell you to this day, my kids like, my mom was always talking to herself and answering herself, right? <laughs> like, I go back and forth with myself. And I always make sure I win. <laughs> I'm going to always win my arguments with me. Um, but it first has to start with the vision. Because if I don't have the vision, then I don't know what direction I'm going in. And so I'm flailing about. I have to know what I stand, what I stand for. So when I start making the argument, I at least know where I'm supposed to end up. And so what happens is something will say, well, you know, you a single mom. You got all these kids. How you going to finish this bachelor's degree? And then I start answering. I'm going to communicate with my professors. I'm going to tell them what my circumstances are, and we're going to work something out. Well, you know you ain't got no money. How you going to do this? And I start answering. I'm going to look for scholarships. So what happened was when those voices started bullying me, they were surprised when I started answering back. Because, you know, they say, you know, something wrong with you if you start talking back. And I got so desperate I was okay with things. Walking down the street, I'm walking down the street, I'm talking. I'm having full-blown conversations with myself because I got to talk myself to the front door of these very extraordinary things that I'm trying to accomplish. And every, every step of the way, something is showing up. I may have one major goal, but 500,000 things are trying to stop me from getting there. And that goal has to be so strong that it mutes those voices. And sometimes my head isn't strong enough to do it on my own, so I have to add my voice to it. And I have to shut it down. Because you know what I know what's not going to happen? Those people in my head are not going to come alive and start talking to me in my face. <laughs> right? They're going to bully me. Because they're cowardly, right? They're going to bully me in my head, but they're not going to come alive and say it to my face. The people that bullied me when I was a kid, they forgot that one day I was going to grow up. And so they, the things they say, oh, don't you remember you used to say, girl, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You told me I couldn't do this, and you told me I couldn't do that. And then when I faced those people, you know what happened? They started telling me, because well, that's what somebody told me I couldn't do. So they was putting their limitations on me. So I, I, when I started talking to myself, you know if I don't care about talking to me, I don't care about talking to you. So the thoughts in my head are bullying me, and you was bullying me, so now I need to tell you about yourself. And then what I noticed is this very human thing started happening. Generations of folks were showing up saying, but I didn't know because this had happened to me. I didn't know how to tell you anything different. So then with me talking back to those voices, forgiveness started happening. Right? The reason why I'm bringing that up is because my perception was that these people were mean to me and they didn't like me. No, folks had been mean to them, so they didn't know how to not be mean to me. And me learning how to speak up to myself and to all the voices in my head, I learned how to give people back the things that they had given me that was harmful. But I also got some compassion along the way. Right? So this goes to speak to the thing that you're talking about. These folks are bullying. But I wonder who bullied them. Because hurt people hurt people, but people who are sincerely confident and loving of, and accepting of themselves, they will sincerely be accepting of you. So if they're bullying you, it's more of a statement about them and how they feel about themselves than it is about you. So the hurt that they're giving you is the hurt that they already have. You understand what I'm trying to say? But I had to learn that when I started talking to people. And so my magic started to increase. Because the more in interactions I had with people and the more relationships I started building and the more encounters I started having, the more those flawed perceptions started turning into real relationships. Right? Mm -hmm. So now here's my question to you. I want you to think of one person that was bullying you in your head when you was coming up with your vision. Think of one person, the meanest person. <laughs> think about the person that you can handle. Think about what you can handle. Think about what you can handle. You don't take the champ at your first fight, right? 
Can't be your first fight. You're trying to take on a champ. So whoever it was that's been bullying you that you can handle, think about that person. And what are you going to say back to that person in your head? So I'm going to give you one minute. I'm going to give you three minutes. Three minutes to come up. Think about that voice, the one that's telling you what you can't do, how you're not good enough, who's placing their, the limitations that someone else has placed on you. Tell me what you're going to say to them in your head. Don't start calling folks, y'all. Don't start texting people. <laughs> we, ain't, we ain't there yet. Just think about what you're going to say in your head. Now, as you think about this, I'm not asking you to come up with a perfect response. It doesn't have to be goody-goody or loving and kind just yet. Because right now, we're in your world on your terms. So you all could respond in the way that you need to feel safe in your world on your terms. And as you get comfortable with being in your world on your terms, then your response will start to reflect that. It will reflect less of the hurt and more of the confidence and more of the compassion. But right now, I'm not asking for a politically correct. I'm just asking for you, how do you defend yourself in that world? How do you speak up? How do you get, find your voice in that world? You can be, it can be something as simple as, that's not nice what you're saying to me. It could be something as harsh as, if you say it again, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> Whatever it is you want to say in your world, in your head, not to people, and don't go around slapping folks. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but in your world, in your head at this moment. All right, what we got? What are we saying to folks that's in our head? We're going to start the tie-dye shirt and then the gentleman in the back with the $65 million, I mean 65 million year old. Sometimes it's hard to forgive someone because we haven't been able to create a space for us to do it, a safe space for us to do it, right? Or because something has been so far in the past that we haven't revisited it in so long that we forgot. Like, I don't even think I really care about that no more.
Well, well, <laughs> so let me tell you why I want us to do this in our heads first. Um, but, so, so well, for one, so we learn, so we learn how strongly we feel about this, first of all. Um, but the other piece is when we're learning how to fight for ourselves, sometimes that, that initial then we learn how to talk up, it's awkward, we fumble, it comes out weird, we cuss folks out, we're flailing, right? But if we can, and then we learn something about ourselves in that moment. Wow, I don't, didn't know I felt that strongly about that. I wasn't expecting that reaction, that, that response, right? And then you have time to really think about it. You have time to really think about it. But in learning how to advocate for yourselves and to push back against the bullies that are in your head, it has to first start with starting your head. Somebody else had their hand up? Wow. But say it again. I'm working at the chef office and aspirin here, up and aspirin up there. You're working at the something office? Chef office. I've never heard of chef. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, this guy named Jim, he's a sister boss of me. He keeps on like, teasing me. So, so what are you saying to Jim? I don't know. I'm telling him he will tease me, but he will get me. I did not. I did. And then what happens? Keep doing it. Keep doing it? Grab it behind my back. Look at me and why you get this getting me a bit. I'm getting a bit angry, but I just don't want to get picked on. I know you're angry because I just got angry. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna tell you what I was thinking about saying to Jim. Yeah, because I'm the one <laughs> I'm the one there all the time with him. Yeah. Yeah. So that you're makes me angry. So you're a step ahead of us in that you've already have approached the person that's in your head. This person is real and you've already encountered that person. That's Jim. Yeah. He's the one that teased me at the workplace. So I want us to pause for a second addressing the folks that's in our head, and I want us to be able to, can three people who've been teased help us figure out what, and who have successfully gotten someone to stop teasing them? What, what did you do? Prevent, okay. And we're all grateful for that. <laughs> we are grateful for that because that smile is priceless. Um, so a couple of things. The idea that talk, so what you did was talk back. You 
thing that we're talking about in your head, you talk back. And then what you all did with the stop yard work is you all changed the whole environment. And so that person, those people who were bullies, they end up becoming the outsiders now. Because I'm going to tell you right now, that campaign worked. My kids, you cannot say the R word around my kids. Like, my kids will jump down your throat so quickly, right? Um, and that's not even a word that we use. But if they hear it on television, if they, he if they hear it from anybody, a visitor, it has become part of the culture that it's not acceptable. And so part, of, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about ultimately how do we go from what's in our head to saying something out loud to shift in the environment. And that campaign was one way to do that. And so I'm wondering at some point, uh, what, what is your name? Sonia. Sonia, and what is your name? And the person behind you with the Batman symbol? Rob. Rob. If, if I'm wondering, Rob, if one of the things that can happen in your workplace is something that's similar to happen in Sonia's environment with the Stop the R campaign. So whatever campaign you want it to be, because then Jim will be by himself, because other people will have the tools that they need to kind of respond by saying, Jim, that's not acceptable in this environment. I'm coming home there. I'm coming home there from the bar. Eye to eye. Eye to eye contact, bro. So we're going to figure, so when this session is over with, you and I need to talk, okay? All right. I just think you need to get this, like I need to get him to stop. Yes, you, we, we have to get him to stop. Because that, the back of my mind, I got up here with Kramer 7 and you and John, that just kicked into my head. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of folks in here can relate to that. What are you all telling the folks that's in your head? So, okay, because I want to bring these two together in terms of my response, in terms of the next step we're doing. So we're going to bracket these two for a second. I want us to go back to step two, and I want you all to tell me in your mind what are you all telling folks, because then I want us to talk about how does that translate into the things that you all are talking about. So in your mind, what are we saying? And then, so we have three people here, we have two people here. So let's start with woman in black, woman in peach, and then woman in gray. You all tell me your names. Candy? Candy. Candy. So in terms of, so I like the fact that you said that you found that, that you put a time period. Yeah. Like this is, this is temporary. Mm -hmm. And that was your, your defense. Did you, did you say that to anybody or that was in your head? No, I said that to that boss. 
Okay. Like, okay, you can treat me like this today, but this isn't happening forever. Okay. And so, you know. So you all are a pretty spunky group of folks. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's happening in your head. You're like, forget that head stuff. I'm telling you what I'm telling people straight up right now, today. All right. Uh, I, did, I did a couple of more head conversations, though. What are you telling people in your head? And then we'll get to the real life stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and and so I control a lot of times things that I can't do because it's too it's too far off, it's too mm-hmm. it's too far beyond me. And so I just have to learn to say, Don't tell me what I can't do because you're afraid to try. Yes. 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 Okay. So again, you all have just flown right past me because that is a lot of my work focuses on policy, right? Yeah. Say it again. That was my daughter, though. So that's okay. Mama Bear talking. You know, yeah. Not something about my personal struggle. But that's important. Yet when people understand that you understand, it's easy to bully someone when you when you're not clear about the consequences. When, when they're not clear and they know that you're not clear. But when you're like, you know, I got a union rep. Or <laughs> I got, no, keep saying what you're saying. Let me make this phone call right quick. Let me put you on speaker. Uh, then people all of a sudden, you know, they, I didn't mean it like that. Um, all right, so. So here's So here's what I'm hearing from you. So what we're talking about are the bullies that's in our head as much as the bullies that are actually in our lives. 
and you all just taught me something because um, you're saying, Sagacious, this wasn't something that was just in my childhood. This is happening to me every single day right now, and I need some strategies for that. Um, it's hard for me to, so what we were going to do, um, we we're going to talk a little bit about those perceptions and how those perceptions get in the way of you accomplishing your vision. But it's not just how the perceptions get in the way, how does this everyday treatment of me get in the way of me realizing how amazing and how powerful and how beautiful I am. And um, somebody else had their hand back here. Three, and then, and then you. Always some damn <coughs> activists ready to. <laughs> <laughs> person behind you, what's your name? And then I'm going to bring it all together for this for the closing. Michael? Yeah. Um, like, uh, the people that uh, how they deal with their relatives, how they deal with certain things, um, my, it may not be the best way, it might be a brutal way, but like, when, if someone, when someone was picking on me and I saw a person I didn't even know getting picked on, what I did is I decided to be the better, I tried to be the better person and basically went up to the person, basically showed them how they made the person feel by doing the same thing to them and they didn't do it anymore. They stopped picking on the people that were different and they didn't do it at all anymore. And I showed them how they were being So here's what you all have taught me, because I got this blue card that's telling me we have to end this. Um, the, what, what you all are telling me and what you all have taught me is a couple of things. We have three minutes. In order for you all to fulfill and accomplish the vision that you have in your mind, well, first of all, let me back up, that for good reason, the, the person that you saw yourself as when you was younger it's hard for you to see that person now because you have been bullied and you've been picked on and you've been counted out and you've been disregarded. And what you all are telling me is that it didn't just happen in childhood. For many of you all, it's still happening today. And what Saya has told me that's really powerful is that one of the things that we can do to transform environments is if we have, if, if we make it a culture, it's expected to do something different. A lot of times, so for instance, the work that I did, when I started Infamous Mothers, it was because women like me had been counted out and we were seen as people who couldn't contribute to society. My argument was never 
that we didn't go through the things that we were being that we were accused of. My argument wasn't that we um, had made choices that probably were unsafe. That was never my argument. My argument was that so many of us are contributing to society and no one is talking about that now. People only talked about us when they could talk about what we were doing wrong or how when they felt that we were less than. But the minute we started accomplishing things, folks didn't want to mention that anymore. And so my goal was to create a new model. Sometimes the work that we have to do is in being defined. And I didn't do it quietly. I didn't talk to a person one-on-one. -on -one. I created a whole website. <laughs> and I made it beautiful, right? And folks were so, they found themselves falling in love with the very thing that they thought that they hated because I made it so beautiful, right? And so sometimes you got to walk a step aside beyond the person that's bullying you. And you have to create a banner that's so big and so beautiful and hold it up where everybody is looking and they're like, wow, I can't refuse that. Like, I want to be a part of that. So it's the shift, it's, it's, to, it's the owning who you are and being comfortable with it and it's making a statement and standing defiantly. And then all of a sudden, it's an invitation for other people to come join you because then your tribe, it's like that Batman signal is going in the air and your people are showing up and they're like, I'm with you, right? But they didn't know it until you put that symbol up in the air, right? So that was what that website was for me. And so what we started doing was creating a new culture. We started shifting the culture in the spaces that, I, that I'm in so that the bullies became the minorities in the group and that the people who were investing in loving us became the majorities in the group. And so we built a new a network. So three things that I've just said, and I want you to catch this. First, I owned whatever my situation was. Whatever my reality was, I owned it. I wrote it out and I announced it and I held it up in the form of a website. It called out to my tribe and my people. And then it shifted the culture. And then all of us started working towards that vision together. I wasn't by myself anymore. And then it started calling people in other countries, in other states. So the one-on-one -on -one wasn't working. In the same way that you're saying the one-on-one -on -one isn't working with you. It was when I started making this, when I stood above the crowd and said, when I got in front of, I spoke at the Women's March, I spoke in front of 100,000 people. I got in, one, I got in front of 100,000 people and said, I'm black, I'm bald-headed, I'm full-figured, I'm poor. Now that we got that out the way, <laughs> let's do the work that we came to do. Right? That was the gist of what I was saying. It's not exactly what I said, the black, bald-headed, poor, that was exactly what I said. But the... Right, and, and, and what, pe what you find is that people gravitate towards you because you're owning it and you're not ashamed of who you are. Right, so we didn't get as far as I wanted to get today, but we got right where we needed to be. Um, and I thank you all. You all are hands down the best crowd I've ever had. Thank you.